All right. Uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, I'd like to just introduce myself. My name is Tarek Azad. Uh, my illustrious colleague over here is uh, Donald Dukas. Uh, and we will be giving a joint lecture today titled, Who Are You Going to Call for Submassive PE? Clock Clusters. Uh, so this is the second in a new lecture series, EM Controversies. Uh, and today we'll be discussing the role of TPA in submassive PEs. Uh, so Don is going to be advocating for its use, and I will be arguing against the use of TPA. Uh, I just wanted to take this time to give a special thanks to Dr. Benebus, Alan, D'Souza, and Kim for their help with this lecture. Mm. All right, great. So just to start off with, what, what the heck is a submassive PE? So it's important to define the different categories of PEs as they relate to their different treatment modalities. Uh, the three major types of uh, pulmonary embolisms are massive, submassive, and then low risk. Uh, despite their names, they don't actually have to do with the, the actual sizes of the PE. Uh, a low risk PE is pretty easy to identify. These are your stable PEs. Uh, normal tensive, uh, no evidence of any cardiac dysfunction, uh, and by definition, if they're not massive or submassive, it falls into this category. So next is going to be your massive PE. Uh, these patients, keep in mind, these are going to be your very, very sick patients. They're either arresting or, or peri-arrest. Uh, the AHA definition for a uh, massive PE is an acute PE with sustained hypotension that's not caused by another source, such as sepsis, arrhythmia, uh, pulselessness or profound bradycardia with a heart rate less than 40 uh, beats per minute or symptoms of shock. So the next slide here uh, describes submassive uh, pulmonary embolism and this is what we're going to focus on for the rest of the lecture. Uh, I want you to just pay uh, special attention to the actual definition here because it's going to come up uh, later on in the lecture. So submassive PE is an acute PE without hypotension but with signs of uh, right ventricular dysfunction with the presence of at least right ventricular dilatation on echo or CAT scan or right systolic dysfunction, elevation of BNP or pro-BNP or new EKG findings of right ventricular strain or evidence of myocardial necrosis by elevated troponin. So in the case of massive PE, there are very clear uh, guidelines that exist that advocate for the use of thrombolysis. Uh, so this uh, slide is showing a clinical practice guideline published uh, in CHEST that clearly uh, advises uh, that in patients with a QPE and associated hypertension that don't have a strict contraindication, systemically administered TPA is advised. Uh, so this recommendation is by the American College of Chest Physicians and it's mirrored by guidelines that have been put out by the American Heart Association as well as the American College of Cardiology. And there's clear benefit to, to actually giving uh, TPA and massive PE. Uh, there's a 2004 meta-analysis done by Wen et al. that looked at about 750 patients. Uh, and there was a number needed to treat of 10 in the composite outcome of recurrent PE and death when looking at specifically the massive PE subset. Uh, so it's great that TPA for massive PE um, has a clear benefit. However, when we look at the subset of submassive PE, uh, the benefit's not as clear. Uh, and in that same uh, analysis by Wen et al., when you look at um, the subset of patients, there were six trials that uh, excluded massive pulmonary embolism. So they're not saying that we're looking at submassive, but if we look at acute PE that is not defined as massive, uh, the mortality benefit um, disappears. And there's a non-statistically significant difference. So then uh, that elicits the question, what do we do when we have a patient who has a submassive PE? Um, we have a subset of patients that have clear benefit, um, but if it's, when you remove that patient from analysis um, and we look specifically at submassive, it's not as clear. Uh, so the first thing I wanna do is um, if, if there's no clear mortality benefit, why are we discussing this? We have an alternative treatment, right? We have heparin anticoagulation that is the mainstay of therapy. Um, so why are we even going to discuss TPA? And the thing I kind of want to point out is that anticoagulation isn't particularly incredibly helpful. Um, this is um, an NNT um, review of a study um, from Dubin. There was 113 participants in two studies. Uh, they looked at um, placebo versus heparin. And the thing that was um, 
important is that there was no mortality benefit here. So really not helping anybody by anticoagulating alone. Um, and there was a significant harm, right? One in 50 to 100 lung patients had significant major bleeding. Um, and greater than one in 50 were harmed significantly. And they said that it was a significant harm or death. Um, that's kind of similar to TPA when we get into those numbers in a little bit. So I want you to kind of keep in mind, you know, we talk about the harms of TPA. I also want you to keep in mind heparin is not benign. Okay. And anticoagulation is not benign. This is not the strongest of reviews and we still have to treat, but I want you to keep these numbers in mind as we go forward. So let's talk about TPA and something that we're familiar with first. We've all given TPA for ischemic stroke, right? Um, so we're going to dig deeper into submassive PE in a second, but I want to kind of just put it, frame it in uh, TPA's numbers in general. So in meta-analysis of about 6,700 patients from nine RCTs that looked at uh, TPA versus placebo, um, they, the outcome that they're looking at here is intracranial hemorrhage at seven days. Um, and there was 40 to 50, um, events depending on the time that it was administered based off of last known. Well, the 90 day all cause mortality was about 71, uh, in patients that received TPA. Um, it's not necessarily the same for submassive PE. Um, and I, I'm going to argue that it's potentially even safer. So, um, what about in MI? This we don't do as much, right? We transfer patients. We give. We don't really give TPA a lot anymore. They should be hopefully going to the cath lab. Um, but it is still, if you don't have access to a cath lab, you work in the community, you work in the rest of the country, you might have to give TPA for an MI. So uh, again, going back to the, the nnt.com plug in Dr. Z. Um, from nine trials, 58,000 patients, okay? Uh, who were randomized to thrombolytic therapy versus placebo for suspected MI based off the EKG. Um, the number needed to harm, again, because we really want to talk about the harms here, TPA, was 143 for an episode of major bleeding. Um, so I want you to think when we're not talking about stroke patients, it's potentially even safer when we're giving TPA. Um, it's also important to note as I go forward and give us the data, these patients are not co-administered heparin. So when we start talking about bleeding rates and TPA for patients that got PE, most of those studies, they're also co-administering heparin, um, which I think really is a big confounding factor when we start looking at numbers going forward. Um, this is confirmed in Dr. Wen's meta-analysis. This is uh, for both massive and submassive PE patients. Um, the meta-analysis again shows that there was um, no statistically significant increase in major bleeding, but there is a significant increase in non-major bleeding. And this is for TPA versus heparin. Um, again, the number needed to harm though for non-major bleeding is eight. So if you give TPA, you can expect the odds are the patient's gonna have some bleeding, losing from the IV site, um, non-life-threatening bleeding. Um, we're going to keep digging into this a little. This was 11 trials, 748 patients. So aside from now that we've kind of discussed the, the safety of TPA, um, a lot of what we're going to talk about next is morbidity and mortality. And uh, I kind of want to pull all of you guys. Anybody here had the misfortune of having to take care of somebody who has pulmonary artery hypertension and is in crisis? No, yeah. yeah, yeah, the attendings, obviously, right? Like, that you guys have. Uh, I said the misfortune because these people are really sick. Um, and the morbidity is high and their life expectancy is not great depending on the severity of the disease. Um, and MOPIT is going to be one of the most quoted studies whenever people talk about TPA and submassive PE, even though it um, might not be as relevant anymore. Single center, uh, randomized, not placebo controlled, it was unblinded, and it includes 121 patients. And uh, they gave low dose. TPA uh, versus anticoagulation alone. Um, and they were looking at a primary outcome of pulmonary artery hypertension and recurrent PE, okay? Uh, the reason that those two are important is because those are the significant points of morbidity. The secondary outcome was mortality. It was looked at. Um, and this is based off a radiologic diagnosis of a submassive PE. So you had to have clinical features of PE and then radiographically um, described as submassive. Um, so although there's no clear mortality benefit with this, the really important thing to come from this study was the incidence of 
um, pulmonary uh, artery hypertension. There was a statistically significant decrease in the amount of patients that had pulmonary artery hypertension at uh, the 28 month follow-up point. Um, there was no statistically significant difference in the rate of major bleeding. Um, there were no events of major bleeding. Uh, I also just want to comment the typical dose of TPA that we talked about, again, goes back to MI patients and they got a hundred milligrams of TPA, right? This trial was so important also because um, they gave half dose and this trial kind of coined the phrase like safe dose TPA, right? Um, and although they showed no mortality benefit, um, the higher doses of TPA had rates of higher bleeding and um, that could have kind of confound your mortality benefit, like I said before. Um, so this trial is also super important in looking at the literature going forward um, because now we're starting to look at things like quarter dose TPA because um, it, this isn't MI, all of your total body volume eventually goes to the lungs. So the doses of TPA that we might be able to administer can potentially be less in the future. Uh, so this is a meta-analysis that includes the Moppet study uh, there's 440 total patients in it, and it looks at low dose versus and standard dose TPA versus anticoagulation, um, and they found no um, increased risk of major bleeding in these patients. Uh, so now, really getting into the data, this is one of the most important trials regarding TPA and submassive PE. This is the PETHOS trial. It's multi-centered, double-blinded, placebo-controlled. There's 76 centers over 13 countries and we have over a thousand patients. So now we're starting to get more patients, more data to look at. They were looking at a composite outcome of um, mortality and hemodynamic decompensation. Um, and they define submassive PE now more consistent with how we define it, um, acute PE with evidence of RV dysfunction and cardiac biomarkers. So this is a much more relevant um, study. Uh, and of it with, uh, the outcome of the study is that there was a statistically significant decrease in all-cause mortality and hemodynamic decompensation in seven days. Um, and this is important also because when you have those hyperacute patients and you're worried about uh, complications like mechanical, uh, like um, intubation and mechanical ventilation and peri PEA arrest, uh, if you're worried that your patient is going to decompensate, this study proves that there is a statistically significant difference in um, all-cause mortality and seven-day decompensation and the number needed to treat is only 33. Um, a little bit more data, even Dr. Chatterjee did a review of TPA in massive and submassive PE uh, and they included the subgroup analysis of submassive PE. Uh, it was eight trials and 1,700 patients. Um, and the inclusion criteria for these patients was intermediate risk PE. So again, more consistent with the definition that we established at the beginning. And the primary outcome was all-cause mortality. Um, and you can see at the bottom with the confidence intervals and the, um, that there's a statistically significant difference um, in all-cause mortality. Um, the number needed to treat was 65. So there is benefit to giving these patients TPA. Um, also now looking at harms again, um, I've highlighted that, uh, all cause mortality at the bottom and your NNT, but also if we're looking at, um, circled right here, number need to harm 176, that's in major bleeding in patients younger than 65. So when we're talking about risk assessment, looking at your patient, um, and coming to a evidence-based best practice decision, um, if your patient's less than 65, that risk of bleeding is significantly less. And there's no statistically significant difference in the rate of bleeding for our younger patients if there's no contraindication. All right. So you heard Don talk quite a bit about why she give TPA. Let's hear the other side of the conversation. Uh, so we're gonna look at some of the literature uh, regarding uh, uh, submassive PEs. And we're gonna look at actually a lot of the same studies that Don discussed. We're going to tease out some of the finer details and see if it maybe changes things a little bit. Uh, two things that I want you to focus on are mortality and morbidity. Did TPA help the patient survive? And if they survived, did it decrease uh, the disease burden that they lived with? So 
there's been a lot of different studies over the years, smaller studies, larger studies that have shown maybe the possibility of mortality benefit uh, for TPA and submassives. As we know, meta-analyses constitute the highest level of evidence and the most commonly cited paper probably by proponents of TPA is this paper that Don mentioned earlier. So this is the Chatterjee meta-analysis. Um, According to this uh, analysis here, there is a mortality benefit. I will say that there's two, uh, there's some major problems with this study. Um, there's two studies in particular that I think uh, we should take a look at closer and why I think that this maybe invalidates some of the findings from this meta-analysis. Uh, the two studies in particular are the Moppet study uh, and the Ultima study. So uh, as Don had mentioned earlier, this is a Moppet study. It's probably one of the more famous studies uh, and it's been used for quite a while as a main argument in favor for TPA and submassives uh, due to the potential morbidity benefit in the reduction of pulmonary artery hypertension. Um, as Don had kind of mentioned a little bit earlier upon closer review of the Moppet study, in the methods section, uh, it reveals that there, the definition that the authors use for submassive is purely a radiographic one. Um, this is not consistent with the commonly uh, used definition of submassive. Uh, it's basically saying patients that have a PE that basically so, show a CTA that has most of the thrombus in more than two lobes or in the main pulmonary arteries or a VQ scan that just shows mismatch in two different lobes. This doesn't say anything about whether there's actual right ventricular dysfunction, whether there's RV strain, whether there's actual myocardial necrosis, none of that. All of these patients may have been submassive PEs or they may not have. We actually don't know because they actually don't mention uh, the uh, diagnostic criteria that we typically use. The other thing that I wanna mention is that there's kind of a lot of questions uh, about the validity of the study. It's a little hard to imagine that with 161 patients uh, in total, there's absolutely no cases of bleeding at all in this study. Even in low molecular weight heparin alone, it's well documented in the literature that the rate of bleeding is one to 2%. So with 161 patients, half of them getting TPA to have no instances of bleeding, they, they must've been some very lucky patients. All right. <laughs> the second study that I'm going to mention uh, is the Ultima study. Uh, so this was uh, another study that was included in the Chatterjee meta-analysis. Uh, this was a trial that was centered around comparing catheter-directed thrombolysis versus anticoagulation. Uh, just to begin with, this may be a viable option for some patients, but this is not the treatment modality that was available for any of the other patients in any of the other studies. It's not a very common modality. Uh, I, I don't know how easy it is to, to get it for any of the patients here at Kings County or Sony Downstate. And for the purposes of, of this discussion, uh, which is focusing around systemic TPA administration, it's not exactly a relevant study. Uh, so I would argue that the inclusion of the Moppet and the Ultima study into Chatterjee's meta-analysis makes its mortality benefit a little bit hard to interpret. So, Luckily for us, there was a subsequent meta-analysis done by Nakamura et al. to evaluate whether there is a potential benefit in mortality. Uh, if you look through the actual studies that are listed here, you're gonna see a lot of the same studies uh, from the Chatterjee analysis. In fact, the only differences are that this meta-analysis excluded the Moppet study and the Ultima study, which we just described uh, may not have been the best studies to include. So unlike the Chatterjee uh, study, this meta-analysis showed that there was a clinically non-significant 1.4% reduction in mortality in patients that got TPA and submassive. Okay, I wanna chime in for a second. You can stay there, but we just talked about there is still a difference, but it's not statistically significant. And um, I want to remind everybody that in these studies, these patients are getting TPA and heparin, and we're already establishing there is an increased rate of bleeding. So I think that the co-administration is going to confound any potential mortality benefit because we now have the uh, morbidity associated with bleeding. Continue. A fair point, except that at least in the MAPA study, there was no bleeding. So you can't blame you can't blame any difference when when there's no bleeding in that study. The other the, the other thing to keep in mind is that anticoagulation for PE very much is just the standard of care. It's 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 going to be really hard to get IRB approval for any study that that compares TPA to to nothing without even anticoagulation. That's that's probably unrealistic to actually happen. All right, so the next study that we're gonna go over is the PITO study. Uh, so this study was very kindly introduced by Don. Uh, it was a great study, one of the largest ones with uh, the largest uh, number of subjects. 
uh, specifically submassive PE with a thousand patients um, with uh, diagnosis by direct ventricular dysfunction or uh, positive ca uh, cardiac biomarkers. Uh, this study looked at full dose TPA, so 100 milligrams, uh, and their primary uh, composite outcome, as mentioned before, was all cause mortality or hem hemodynamic decompensation. Uh, so looking at the details a little bit, there's one thing that I kind of want to stress that's, that's important. We should be very careful anytime the primary outcome for a study is a composite score. So their, their primary outcome was all cause mortality and hem hemodynamic decompensation. If we tease out those two things and look at them separately, if we look at all cause mortality, there was no difference in, uh, in uh, death from any cause in any of these patients. It was entirely based on hemodynamic decompensation. Uh, the other thing that I want to mention that at least in this study, uh, the rate of bleeding in the TPA group was five times higher than those in uh, placebo. So the entire difference in the primary outcome of the study came from the outcome of hemodynamic decompensation. But how important is this actually? So even in the group that didn't get TPA that later developed hemodynamic decompensation as they defined it, only half of those patients actually ended up getting TPA afterwards. And we already know that there wasn't a reduction in, there wasn't a mortality difference between these groups. This was an intention to treat study. Once they were randomized, they stayed in those groups and they weren't switched over even if they got TPA later. Um, so really how much does it actually matter? Maybe these patients had transient hypotension, they got some pressors, they improved. Uh, maybe they got uh, hypotension from something else. Maybe they had sepsis or pneumonia or something during these seven days in the hospital. Okay or felt it, whatever, as, Don likes, as Don was mentioning. Whatever the case may be, we don't exactly know how clinically relevant this, this finding of hemodynamic decompensation is. So your next question may be, well, if they had hemodynamic decompensation, maybe they just had a large enough clot burden, and maybe the seven days from the original PITO study wasn't long enough to actually look at the problems that can happen. Maybe they're gonna develop some problems later on. Well, let's probe into that question a little bit further. So the authors from the original PITO study conducted a long-term three-year follow-up study of the original 1,000, about 700 of them participated in the study. Uh, their primary outcome in this case was long-term mortality, and their secondary outcomes were the patient-centered outcomes of heart failure and pulmonary hypertension. Uh, looking at the primary outcome of this long-term study, uh, there was no clinically significant difference uh, in mortality between either of these groups. And most importantly, in stark contrast to previous findings, the results of this study showed no difference in the incidence of right-sided dysfunction, heart failure, or any difference in pulmonary artery pressures, arguing against the morbidity benefit of thrombolysis in submassives. So looking at everything in total, We've, we've looked at mortality. It doesn't look like there's necessarily a, a benefit in mortality. We've looked at the initial morbidity shown in Moppet, um, which it doesn't seem to be able to be replicated in the long-term uh, follow-up with PITHO. Should we really be giving TPA in these patients if we can't prove any mortality or morbidity benefit? All right, so we both uh, presented our sides of the argument, either for and against. Uh, we're gonna go over some points now, some concluding points to keep in mind if you find yourself in this clinical scenario. Uh, so first of all, uh, it's probably maybe one of the more important slides I have to tell you. Uh, it's important to keep in mind what the foundations of evidence-based practice actually is. Uh, it's not just clinical experience and it's not just best scientific evidence. It also incorporates patient values. I could have decades and decades and decades of experience in this one particular thing, and I could have all the literature in the world to, to support exactly my view. But if I'm not listening to what the patient actually values and taking their beliefs uh, into heart, then you're not really gonna be practicing true evidence-based medicine. I spent quite a bit of time arguing against the use of TPA, but if I honestly had a patient that had a submassive PE, I would be wrong to not at least discuss uh, with them that thrombolysis was an option and at least incorporate their ideas into a shared decision-making process. So I, I just wanna, again, harp that I think that that last slide the Tarek went through was probably the most important, that everything has to be a discussion with their patients. You give them the evidence in the uh, most plain way possible, and you talk risk benefits and alternatives, right? 
Um, and we're, again, looking out at a special subset of patients, when you're having that discussion with a patient, hey, I don't really know if there's a huge benefit here, but some trials say you might have a better seven day outcome. You could potentially have a, a reduction in your long-term morbidity. If the patient is less than 65. Um, we are, we can not comp, not very confidently, but uh, the data suggests that these patients are not gonna have the same rates of major bleeding or any different rate of major bleeding versus heparin or anticoagulation. So um, you need to keep these uh, patient, uh, individual patient factors in mind. Um, and then again, so now say, what if I don't have a young patient? Uh, you know, is there anything that puts my patient at a greater risk of decompensation? Um, and here we have a meta-analysis, it's a systemic review, it's 10 cohort study. They had patients that had acute PE and then they looked back and said, which patients uh, did not do well and what were the fa what um, were the factors that maybe contributed to these patients. And uh, seven studies that looked at uh, mortality as a primary outcome, concomitant DBT had a significantly um, increase, statistically significant increase in 30 day mortality. Uh, you were two times more likely to um, have a higher 30 day mortality if you had a DBT uh, concomitantly with a PE. So when you're having that risk benefit discussion, aside from just age being a factor, comorbidities and um, other illnesses occurring at the same time need to be discussed and taken into account. Um, and then all of this kind of comes to a head. There was a great uh, systematic review um, by Dr. Riva and their team. Uh, there's 12 systematic reviews, two guidelines and with 20 original RCTs included. Um, and they found that there was concordance with these, within these studies and that um, there did appear to be an all-cause mortality benefit um, with the number needed to treat of about 65. Uh, and these, this is specifically for patients with intermediate risk PE. Um, it's kind of confounded though by the fact that they also found that, you know, these patients are at an increased risk of bleeding. Uh, the number needed to harm of only 22. So I think you need to take into account your patient's age, risk factors, um, and risk of bleeding when you're going to be making these clinical decisions. Um, and that's kind of where we're headed potentially in the future. Like, is there a better way to make these clinical decisions? And it shouldn't, we, we're kind of trying to get to, we don't think it should be made based off of the fact of, is this a um, submassive PE or not? And have it be binary, like yes or no. You need to take things into account is, is this a hyperacute PE? Is this a uh, patient at risk of mechanical uh, ventilation and need for intubation? Is this patient peri PEARS, but not quite meaning definition of massive PE yet? Um, this isn't validated, this isn't studied yet, but I think it is an important point um, that we should be cognizant of how acute the clot is, the patient's factors, did they syncopize? Um, all of these things need to be taken into account when we're making this decision. Um, we're kind of curious to hear what you guys would do if your patient gets a submass opinion. Okay, so uh, as Dom was mentioned, we were interested in seeing what uh, the faculty's uh, individual practice preferences were. So we sent out a uh, survey to the faculty LitServe uh, that described this following scenario. So I'll just very quickly kind of uh, describe this vignette. It's a 40 year old female in OCPs who uh, presented with shortness of breath, had one day of dyspnea on exertion, decreased exercise tolerance, and pleuritic chest pain, uh, was tachycardic. Uh, and tachypnic, but normal sensitive with ECG showing lateral two wave inversions. Uh, the labs were notable for an elevated dimer, uh, BNP, as well as troponemia. The bedside echo showed D sign and McConnell sign. Um, and uh, the CTA was notable for a right low bar uh, pulmonary embolism. So uh, this is the results of the uh, responses that we got back. Uh, so the first slide uh, here basically just asks the question, uh, would you give this patient that was described with a very typical submassive PE TPA? Uh, so it, it shows essentially a 50-50 split between the faculty between those that would give TPA and those that wouldn't uh, in the case of submassive. Uh, the second picture here asks the question, if TPA was given, what dose uh, would be used? Uh, and uh, surprisingly, of the uh, attendings that would give TPA, the vast majority actually would choose to use half-dose TPA as opposed to full-dose TPA. Uh, the third question uh, shows a uh, split between uh, whether uh, people would give anticoagulation or not after giving TPA. Uh, and the fourth picture just shows that there was a wide range of years of experience among the faculty that responded. So. These are our citations. And then uh, 
we can uh, open uh, open it up to any questions. What are you guys doing? So what's the mortality difference between a submassive and a submassive? Some land, I don't remember what's happening. If you have a slide like four or five. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is a big part of why you can't really prove a, a mortality benefit in giving TPA when the mortality to begin with in submassive is not necessarily there. That, that's going to be an argument that's going to. Isn't that the argument not to give TPA? Mortality difference between a regular PD and a submassive is about the same. Right. Yeah. Why should I give a drug that has a higher complication than? Sure. So, so the. So the biggest, the biggest argument I'll, I'll put on the hat from the other team is that there's a morbidity benefit, at least it's argued, that even though there may not be a mortality benefit, a lot of these patients may end up having very terrible pulmonary uh, artery hypertension later on and all the things that come associated with that. It, about the disability, same with stroke. Yeah, about the stroke. Yeah, this is about disability with pulmonary hypertension, same conversation. Oh, that's that where this gets complicated, right? Yeah. So my current residency is not surprised, it's huge, and this uh, the, the idea of implementing uh, pulmonary hypertension in the future was a big aspect, I think, of why we consider treating. And forget the half dose full dose. So it was just the idea, do you, do you get TPA at, at all for it? And the half dose was just to try to reduce the, the bleeding risks and the adverse effects of TPA. But now, right, with, with updated studies showing actually there might not be a benefit for uh, heart failure or pulmonary hypertension. I think this is where we have to say, okay, maybe now there, there isn't uh, as much of a reason to give it. I do think that in the patient case you present, you know, a 40 year old uh, person with no big risk factor, probably the risk of major bleeding is very, very low and lower than the average when you look at the study of, of major bleeding when you do the subgroup analysis and things. But uh, I think now the, the, the more complicated uh, idea is that maybe there is not a morbidity benefit and the data is less clear about the morbidity. Uh, so I kind of agree with what Dr. Sinard said based on the fact that we're including all submassive. And I think that that's kind of the failing of all these studies is that we can't, it's hard to identify high risk patients and only include high risk patients in the study. Exactly. And then if we really want to see the benefit, I think that we need to talk about PEA arrests because that's really what happens in most of the patients, right? We're looking at them. That's why we give it to the massive patients because it's like you are hypotensive, you are funded, you have a massive PE, and this is any other little insult that you're going to arrest. And I think that we need to identify the intermediate uh, or um, submassive PEs that are that have high risk features or are low risk for bleed before we start discussing TPA. And then I want to say the one thing in Moppet that we can't I can't prove at all, but I, I is at least thought provoking to me is is location actually important? when you talk about morbidity, if it's not in the main pulmonary artery, is the incidence of pulmonary artery hypertension going to be less? Like does shunting physiology and things of that nature, is it protective as long as it's not in the main pulmonary vessel? The other thing is that patients who survive the PD, right? They survive the PD. So if they survive the PD, right? Then they have Sometimes get tired from breathing so fast. Yeah. Yeah. Very small. I think it's a very small. Yeah. Okay. Oh, there, there, there is a there is a subset of patients that are able to compensate if for a while. Right. If it's someone who has who is is elderly, right, who has cancer, who's going to have the next PD, then put a filter in. Them. Find the DVT. Put a filter in. Mm -hmm. That's the problem with a lot of these studies. They ended everyone. With a submassive PD. There's a subgroup, and I think a pretty large subgroup, of the patients who have cancer, who have recent orthopedic surgery, they're going to have another PD because the same process is still there. Mm -hmm. And maybe we should just put a filter in. Well, I'm going to argue, I don't even think I'm going to give that patient, uh, not that it's my right to say <laughs> none of these patients need TPA, but I think that their long term benefit 
right? We're talking about long-term outcomes and like survivability and quality of life. And if the cancer is the primary problem, I could perseverate on the TPA and the PE all I want, but that's really not what's killing this patient, I think. Right. And those and those just but a 40 year old may be yeah. a young person, a young person may have a longer term benefit. And those are the patients we should look at in studies mm -hmm. and take out the 70 and 90 year old Agreed. The patients who have recent orthopedic surgery, mm -hmm. the patients who have cancer. We should take them out yeah. of the TPA. Studies. So and then and we should just look at young patients who have PEs, which I think luckily is a very small. Group. Yeah, but the, the other thing that I hate about a lot of this data is that these patients are giving TPA and then bolus heparin, which I think is freaking insane. For stroke patients, it's 24 hours later before we start amputate or anything else again. Yeah. Why do we have to give TPA and then bolus heparin? I think there's a very clear like, I gave TPA, start heparin in 24 hours. Yeah, right, because why are we giving heparin in any way? It's to prevent, you know, uh, further clot propagation, exactly. Or preventing, right, uh, extension of the current one. So we don't need to rush to start heparin if we're giving the TPA patients, right? Yeah. We're not, right, the heparin is not doing anything back to you. The heparin, right, well knows why is it increased risk of bleeding a lot of these things? The heparin, right? heparin's real, heparin's really tough to mm -hmm. therapy. And yeah. with, with DOAX, right, there, there is, there is a potential benefit for this and, and preventing the bleeding. The only reason not to give TPA in town in UHP is because the ICU guys don't agree. All right. That's the other important thing so to so keep in mind. Know, it's Whenever I think about it, I always call them and I say, you know, there is some data one way or the other. You're going to get the patient, right? It's going to be your patient in a few hours. You want to start the TPA down here. If they say no, then it's yeah. So for the people at home, Dr. Sinner brings up a good point of uh, not necessarily shunting the entire decision to the ICU. We can have that, that conversation. But if you give a patient TPA, they're going to need to have ICU level monitoring afterwards. You need to have some degree of, of buy-in by your, uh, your intensivist colleagues as well. So yeah. can, I, can I propose a patient that I have a friend who's my age. She's like, she's a little mid thirties, went skiing and the thing kept hitting him in the back of the leg. And he had a provoked DVT and P. And he did not, he was like, he's knowledgeable. He's an orthopedist now. And he was like, yeah, I want the TPA. He was like, there wasn't nervous about it at all. He wanted it. And uh, they wouldn't give it to him. And I think rightfully so, it was a, a low risk PE. But if that, if he say he does have submassive, he has a new right bundle and uh, no tropes, but an elevated BNP. And, uh, you know, it's, you know, Zilferian's on upstairs. And he's uh, usually not a huge proponent of TPA. Are you going to say, listen, you talk to Z upstairs and he doesn't want to give it, we're not going to give it, and the patient that I think could benefit, the patient's okay with it? Yeah, I prioritize the discussion with the patient. Yeah. I agree with that. I think it's one of the things you guys want, but I know it's discouraging that you come out of here. What's the standard of care? And that's what you should do. It shouldn't be based on what you did. Well, it's not so I don't know. Think it's not the standard of care. So, 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 you, so you two did a fantastic job. You really went over all the literature. I think you both really, your preps were, were fantastic. And just like all of these, these lectures in these, this controversy series is going to be, literature needs, you know, you need more literature and, and more defined literature. I go back to the slide that you both said was the most important. Right? I'm 63. I'm extremely active. If it's me, I want PPA because I, I will just go bonkers if I can't do some of the things that I currently do. Mm -hmm. that will, that will, so I'm not worried about, I'm not going to die from submassive PPE, but if I can't, you know, work out and run and, you know, and do all the things that I love to do, um, it's, it's really going to have a long-term morbidity. For sure. And I think the other thing kind of related to this that we see not have data on, and look, this is what I talk about when we talk about setting patients for cat, you know, uh, you know, stenting and stable angina. I'm interested to know what are the actual symptoms that need to present, right? Are they really breathless when they want? Will TPA actually include their acute symptoms? So they mm -hmm. can be functional. Forget the long-term morbidity, right? That may be depressing, just acutely. Are they going to be able to function and go to work? We don't know that, right? I mean, those are the patients where if you have stable angina, you know, maybe getting a cap is worth it. It's going to allow you to function appropriately. Maybe it doesn't prevent things long term or poor workout. Uh, that's what I'm more interested with here is the acute symptom resolution. Will, will it yeah. provide an effect to the patient that maybe it will be beneficial? Okay.
I'm just going to say something real quick. Um, you know, the point that, you know, obviously you have to discuss with, um, with your patient to the point to, the, to Dr. Lucchese. Yeah. If we knew that TPA was going to definitely improve, like, you know, um, you're not going to get, um, uh, you know, uh, pulmonary hypertension, then yeah, it's, an, it's a no brainer. The problem is, is that, and that really the question is, is does TPA prevent pulmonary hypertension? And we don't know the answer to that question. Um, Moppet, when the study came out, it was very exciting. We're like, oh, we're going to prevent pulmonary hypertension in all these patients. And we're going to start giving them um, half dose TPA. But then, you know, you look at the data and you know what that study, not as great as you, as you wanted it to be. And then the PICO study comes out. And, and, and the problem I have is that we really are just, it's not convincing that you're going to actually reduce pulmonary hypertension. Right now, there's, the data is not good on it. So I think there's a, you have to be careful about falling into the trap of we want something to work rather than it actually works. Um, and that's something I think we see with a lot of therapies. I think that's something that, um, that you, you, we fall into, that the neurologist fell into the trap of TPA is a, is a ma you know, major fix for all strokes. There's probably some element of utility for it, but it's probably not as useful as we want it to be. And so we have to be careful. Yes, we have an intervention we can do, but that doesn't mean it's going to actually work. And I don't know what the answer is. I want it to work, but I don't, I don't think the data is there yet to say that giving somebody 50, um, 50 milligrams of TPA is going to prevent them from getting pulmonary hypertension in the future. I just, we just don't have the answer yet. I want it to. Uh, I just want to bring up a point real quick. Uh, thank you, Tark and Don. That was great discussion. Uh, just to kind of pick back on what Dr. Shikta was saying. Uh, so we don't have great data. Mo I think Moffitt is a very good example of a study that before taking on a new practice to actually understand what the study is and if it's actually good enough to change your practice. There are just so many problems with that study. The randomization is not really reported. How they randomize the patient is but unclear. A kind of most of the patients they approached say yes and agreed to go into the study, which is anybody who has done clinical research knows how hard that is to actually pull up. Uh, no side effects, like zero, which is also an odd number. It's just so many problems with that study. Um, but at the same time, I don't think we can, this, this is an area that still needs a lot of research. And I don't think just because it doesn't have mortality benefit, it doesn't show mortality benefit, we can kind of not like, we can say, oh, okay, then we are not gonna do it because there's no mortality benefit. Because even in massive T, if you look at the original studies, there is no mortality benefit. The outcome that they looked at is mortality plus recurrent T. So with that kind of logic of, if there's no mortality benefit, we shouldn't do it. We shouldn't even give TPA to massive TEs. So I think this is an exciting topic to work on and see if there is actually a, more, a benefit long-term in terms of like pulmonary hypertension. Uh, but yeah, the current data doesn't seem to be suggested that it actually has um, proven benefits. Great, thank you, Rush. Um, I think there was a, a comment that Robbie wanted to make. He's been waiting for quite a yeah. while. Just to refocus, um... I don't think the argument for giving TPA for some massive PE is for long-term morbidity. I think the data from Pytho, I think one argument is for short-term uh, outcomes. I know we're saying mortality, there may not be a benefit, but there is a benefit shown statistically significant for decompensation, meaning patient may not go, may not crash and go to the ICU, get intubated, et cetera. So I think that's the strongest argument in favor of giving uh, TPA. Um, I also think you have to risk stratify. Um, one of the faculty mentioned, if a patient has a DVT, that might be a risk factor that they might throw a future clot. So that might be a patient where you would want to give TPA. So I think there has to be, maybe you have to redefine what, or break down some SP into uh, different classes of risk. Um, I think also the age thing, I just wanna emphasize, if you're less than 65, the risk of bleeding, um, data shows that there's no increased risk of bleeding. So those are my two points. Thanks, Robbie. I concur. Sure. But uh, we did mention before when, when you looked at the, the hemodynamic decompensation, teasing out that, that specific subset, 
there wasn't an increased mortality in those patients. And then longer term, those patients didn't do worse. So yes, maybe they required pressors, maybe they need mechanical ventilation for a little bit, but the long-term implications of that doesn't seem to be any different than, than the other group. So I'm gonna ask a systems question. During COVID, we've had no ICU beds. Do you feel more comfortable knowing that the patient's less likely to decompensate if it's a low risk bleeding patient? I am not horribly concerned about bleeding. You have that shared decision-making. Are you, does that factor in, do systems issues factor in? Sure, no, maybe, if you, no. maybe if you had no ICU beds. I don't, and, think, data's yeah. I don't think you should make a, a, like a system level call and do something against standard of care. Do something that's not standard of care just because of the system level issue. I think that's what you just did. Okay. Bye bye. What do you guys think about the survey? That's fine, 50%. I was not expecting 50% of people to be okay with TPA. Yeah. Yeah. I think it was 20, but I also think of the fact that she's 40. Yeah. I think, I think we tried to, to give a, a relatively safe patient uh, to give TPA to, um, but I was very much surprised by, by the results of, uh, of that. I was not expecting that high of a number to be able to, to be willing to give TPA. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Any other comments by uh, anybody in the chat? Peanut Gallery, what do you got to say? They, they, they did a lot. They did a lot. <laughs> okay. Thank you guys. Woo!